from Mario to Master Chief. That game is awesome. 8 bit to high def. The battle is on. It's one team trying to beat the other team. Heroes versus assassins. Finish him. Finish him. Finish him. Legends versus monsters. She's the toughest bad guy in the game. Boom shakalaka! We're counting down the top 100 video games of all time. Cool. Mario Brothers is basically like a, a quest on acid. Just last night, I was lost in the jungle with Pitfall Harry. I love shooters. Best game of all time is Mario Party. Skyrim is a way of life. Best game of all time. But that's a game we used to play a lot. Portal is the best game on the planet. I got really hooked on that game. Grab your Lancer, duck behind some cover, and prepare for... Number 80 on our countdown, Gears of War 3. Here we go again! Gears of War 3, man, is like my favorite video game. Released in 2011, Gears of War 3 brought fans bigger battles, better multiplayer action, and an explosive conclusion to the epic story of Marcus Phoenix and his ongoing battle against the vile Locust Horde. We really swooped in with an amazingly well-polished game that had the best of both worlds from the first and second game. We knew this was the end of the trilogy. This was the end of Marcus's story, and it had to be the best one ever. And basically, Gears 3 is just four games in one game, but the campaign is huge, Horde is huge, Beast is huge, competitive multiplayer is huge. I feel like I'm a beast. Like, I feel like, you know, there's no competition. I could, I could hold my own against anybody in the game when I'm online. My husband and I play together. I do a lot of shooting him in the face and then acting like I didn't know it was him, which is really hard to do after like the hundredth time you've assassinated your husband. To be like, oh my god, is that you, honey? I didn't, I didn't realize that. I was so, I'm so sorry. The Horde mode in Gears 3 is insane. It's addictive. I start playing at 7 o'clock at night, and the next day I know the sun's coming up. Intense action has always been a staple of the Gears franchise. But what really set Gears of War 3 apart was its moving storyline. We did a really good job of blending kind of seamless cinematic gameplay with really, really good storytelling. That kind of culminates in the death of a key character about halfway through the game, which a lot of gamers really have told us that has brought them to tears. Dom's death. I sat in silence for four minutes. We paused it. We couldn't do anything else. It was so well done. The acting, the writing. I was literally crying. It's that good. And we tried to make something that everyone can connect with. And so I think that's one of the strengths of Gears of War is that it has characters that people can relate to. Don't dies. Bleep that. I was sad. We were pissed. We had to drink after that. We had to pour out a 40 for our homie. Gears of War 3 improved on two already incredible games to create a bullet-riddled masterpiece that we'll be playing for years to come. Gears of War 3 will always have a special place in my heart. There are so many huge releases every year, yet Gears 3 has been in my Xbox 360 every day since it dropped, and there's something to be said about that. Next up, a trippy psychology lesson disguised as a video game. At number 79, Psychonauts. Psychonauts blew my mind. You are all psychic soldiers. The brainchild of devious game designer Tim Schafer, Psychonauts hit consoles in 2005. Part platform game, part mind-bending adventure, the game's plot concerned, well, let's have Jack explain. You're this kid. My name starts with a D. He's Rasputin. Who goes to this psychic camp for kids to develop their psychic powers. The adventure takes place in different people's minds and psyches. And you gotta like 
figure out their psychological damage to conquer the game. It's pretty groundbreaking and creative. This is so cool. I took a class on dreams, and, and people, when they have dreams, they take their, their lives' problems and turn them into these crazy, real, literal, like, monsters that you fight in your head. So we could do anything we want in that game. We could go anywhere. Area attack! There's a level in the game that's a meat circus. It's a circus, and it's meat. It doesn't actually make any sense, but it's amazing because it's that surreal nature of it. Psychonauts was critically lauded upon release and attracted a cultishly devoted fan base, even if the game was viewed as a commercial flop. It is one of the best uh, games I ever played. It should have gotten more attention than it ever got. Obviously, it made your list, so there's something to be said here. Is this your list of top 100 games that were canceled? Because I don't know how many games on this list were canceled, but that game was canceled. And it came back from the dead, and it is still here on this list. We're still talking about it, so take that, universe. Up next, an arcade classic that combines fast driving, quick reflexes, and some very satisfying road rage. It was James Bond, but they couldn't say it was James Bond. At number 78, Spy Hunter. Spy Hunter. Awesome game. The early 80s saw a glut of driving and racing games, but there had never been one that also let you shoot at stuff. What's great about Spy Hunter is that it, rather than just being a generic driving game, it actually gave your car a character. Spy Hunter was the game that everyone wanted to play just so they could feel like they were in Knight Rider. Spy Hunter put players behind the wheel of the kick-ass G6155 Interceptor, which got some deadly upgrades every time they could hitch a ride on one of these trucks. The main payoff of the game is the truck comes, you drive in the truck. I remember constantly looking for that stupid van to drive into, and I think you got a smoke screen or oil slick or whatever when you ever went into that van. You know, their cars are coming up, you're like, oil slick, son. You know? Messed up. But getting on the truck got you more than an awesome upgrade. It gave players a chance to hear a spy classic. <laughs> cool music, slick weapons, and a great release for lots of pent-up road rage made Spy Hunter one of everyone's top games. Shooting the guys, Spy Hunter, I, I could play it all day. Next, a classic motocross game for the NES that still sets hearts racing. Excite Bike on Nintendo. <laughs> Old school, where you get to make your own tracks and all of that. I'll take it all the way back to 86. At number 77, it's Excite Bike, one of the original games available upon Nintendo's American release. Excite Bike. That's the original video game that beats all video games. Excite Bike was neat because it made me want to get into motocross. It inspired the average bow legged biker like myself to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to jump our Ford Festiva. Simple in design, but extremely rewarding, Excite Bike offered a revolutionary feature, the ability to custom design your own tracks. I think a lot of people forget how far outside the box that was back then, to let you take control and kind of build your own level. If you wanted to really make a time trial track that you wanted all your friends to come over and try and you couldn't wait for them to get there, that's what Excite Bike did. I think for me what made this game uh, so much fun it was the sound design. If you play the motorcycle sound in Excite Bike to anybody my age, they will they can immediately tell you what video game that came from. A simple yet unforgettable classic, Excite Bike laid the groundwork for every Nintendo racing game that came after it and exposed gamers everywhere to a new world of virtual speed. Coming up next. The fight for the top spot continues. Oh, I totally play just the fight. And no one's playing nice. Oh my god, that knee punch. <laughs> Will your favorite game live to see the next round? This is pretty much the freaking coolest thing you could ever imagine. But first, before Peter Gunn, what was the original song used in Spy Hunter? The answer after the break.
Before the break, we asked what was the original song used in Spy Hunter before Peter Gunn? The answer, the James Bond theme by Monty Norman. It's time to throw down on the ice. At number 76, Blades of Steel. Blades of Steel was an arcade hit, ported to the original NES in 1988. And while it lacked an official NHL license, Blades of Steel still satisfied with liberal amounts of what every hardcore hockey fan clamors for. Ah, hands down, the best sports video game of all time, Blades of Steel. Why? One reason, fighting. Oh, I totally play just to fight. If I can't knock you out and hurt you, then I don't want to play. Right, if you got into a fight with another player and you lost the fight, then you ended up in the penalty box. When does the loser also then get penalized unless it's communism? Blades of Steel is pulling no punches when it comes to what makes this NES Classic one of the best sports games of all time. Hockey players getting concussions, that's a sports game. Forget everything else. And now, a post-apocalyptic epic that nuked gamers' idea of what an RPG could be. At number 75, Fallout 3. That game is awesome. It also made me uh, prepare, like, a really well-stocked Armageddon kit. Released in 2008, Fallout 3 dropped gamers into the middle of a post-nuclear Washington, D.C. and a fight for survival. You renegade and you find yourself out in the earth that has been destroyed by this nuclear disaster. And it's all about kind of interacting with the locals that live out there. Outsider, you have arrived. Please come closer. So you're like fighting people in the middle of the desert. You know, you're fighting these giant mutant brutes. I got into some weird cult where there's like a tree god who's like, please kill me. Wave bye-bye, Bob. You've got this whole world open to you, and you're like a kid in the candy store. You just want to run around and try everything at once. I killed the ant lady. I wore her ant head for a while after I killed her. The open world of Fallout 3 was so enormous, it took players hundreds of hours to explore it all. Oh. I think at the end, probably might have pushed, like, it might have been pushing towards 300 hours of, of Fallout 3 that I played. I set challenges for myself to collect every single outfit that they was in the wasteland. So in my house, I had closets of different clothing, which, why would I do that? That was the one game that almost, like, did me in. My girlfriend's like, go to sleep. It's like, three, I will. Three in the morning, cuts it. Like, eight in the morning. I have to be at work at, like, 10. I'm like, Still playing it. That's what I like the most about it. Really fun. Hours and hours and hours of fun. Fallout 3 mashed together RPG conventions, an enormous open world, and the frenetic gameplay of a shooter to create one of the best games of all time. It has literally excels in every single area, from the storytelling, from the depth, from the amount of characters and experience that you have. It's really the type of game that you spend days and days and days exploring. Fallout 3 is one of my all-time favorites. Next, a game that transformed a Nintendo character into a video game icon. At number 74, it's Star Fox 64. Playtime is over, Star Fox. Ah, uh, I remember playing Star Fox 64. Oh man, Star Fox, one of those brings me back. It was great. It's brilliant. Star Fox 64 was amazing. Released in 1997, Star Fox 64 blasted Fox McCloud and the popular Nintendo series into the third dimension. It was just sort of our, our harmless game because it was about a fox in a spaceship, which your parents can't get mad. When Star Fox 64 came out, everybody was really excited about how good the graphics were. We need your help, Star Fox. The graphics were incredible, the, the colors, the, the, what you were able to do with the spaceship. When it was released, Star Fox 64 flew off the shelves and shot down Mario to become the fastest selling N64 game ever. Take that! If you had an N64, you had this game. You know why? Because the characters talked. Never give up! Trust your instinct! Some, some sound effects and voices that are a little bit too over the top. Do a barrel roll! Do a barrel roll! Barrel roll! <laughs> Do a barrel roll! Thanks. Thanks, buddy. 
Thanks for reminding me that I'm barrel rolling right now. I actually secretly hoped that I was in some kind of last starfighter scenario where I could fly a, a hypothetical spaceship at this point and fight to save the universe with other animal themed heroes. My Emperor, I failed you! Not all great Nintendo platformers feature Mario or Luigi. At number 73, it's Mega Man 2. God, Mega Man, you play those games? They're amazing. Mega Man 2 was released on the NES in 1988 and was an instant hit. Mega Man 2 is probably one of the coolest video games ever because it's it's like a superhero game. You know, Mega Man was damn, he was cool. I love Mega Man, Dr. Wily, all those guys. Mega Man 2 is one of my all-time favorite games as well. I still have my ringtone as the Mega Man 2 theme song. I remember playing for hours and hours after school, trying to become like, you know, like a Mazo from Justice League, have every superpower. Mega Man 2 gave you the choice of which bosses you wanted to be, but figuring out which robot master you should take on first was half the challenge. You had to pick them in a very specific order because in order to defeat one boss, you had to have the weapon that you got from beating another boss. So it was kind of this puzzle that you had to figure out once you played it enough or if you had Nintendo power. Mega Man 2 challenged players like no platformer had before and inspired a generation of platformers that followed. The Mega Man 2 was incredibly hard. It came out when you know we were kids and we had the time and patience to deal with that game. But I think today, I don't think kids could handle that game today. That is a challenge. That is a challenge to you at home that you could not finish that game. Mega Man 2 is the only game that I love that I've never been able to get past two levels on. Coming up next, one of the most controversial games of all time. Finish him! Dun, dun, dun. Ah! Plus, we finish off the Death Star. You actually felt like you were piloting the ship. Before taking out the Templars. Double hidden blade assassination. <laughs> but first, which of these games was originally conceived as a TV show by Steven Spielberg? The answer when the top 100 video games return. Before the break, we asked which of these games was originally conceived as a TV show by Steven Spielberg. The answer, The Dig. It was based on an idea for an episode of the TV series, Amazing Stories. Next up, a classic fighting game that brought a new level of action, intensity, and infamy to gaming. Finish him, finish him, finish him. Dun, dun, dun. Finish him! At number 72 on our countdown, one of the most notorious and controversial games ever, Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat! Ah, come here! It was brutal. That Mortal Kombat was exceptionally brutal. It became one of those games that's corrupting the youth of America. Ah! Congress had this whole thing started going after the video game industry, and they're like, these video games are making kids violent. I was like, there was never a time where, you know, I'm gonna go to school and beat some kid up. Mortal Kombat is credited with inspiring the ESRB game rating system and was the first game to warrant an M rating for its mature content. Mortal Kombat was not appropriate for children. And that's, of course, why all the children wanted to play it at the arcade. Mortal Kombat was a game that you know, only a few of the kids had, and you know, everybody wanted to go over to their house and play when their parents weren't around. It was like somebody having a dirty magazine or something. Everybody wanted to go and, you know, rip somebody's head off. Mortal Kombat hit arcades in 1992 and hit hard. With its brutal one on one death matches and plentiful gore, the game couldn't help but attract attention. Kato wins. I remember being a teenager and coming into the arcade, and I'm hearing all these sounds of just this, oh, ah, finish him. I don't know, all these like kung fu sounds, and it had this kind of like photorealistic style that I hadn't seen up to that point yet. It was amazing. It was the first time that I saw people lining up to play an arcade game. 
It's the first time I saw people putting their money down and saying, I got next. In the wake of other fighting games, Mortal Kombat stunned with its over-the-top gameplay and brutal level of violence. Street Fighter 2 had become this kind of phenomenon. And then Mortal Kombat comes along as the guy in the rated R movie, and there's buckets of blood flying around, there's uh, disembodied voices laughing. <laughs> all of the awesome, really fun things that you got to do with the characters, instead of just hitting them, were all insanely magical and insanely, like, violent and deadly. As a teenager, this is pretty much the freaking coolest thing you could ever imagine. Mortal Kombat did more than provide hours of entertainment. It changed video games forever. The finishing moves, the brutalities, like all the mythology to it. Mortal Kombat was a game that you would play over and over. And surprise, years later, I think the kids are all right. Mortal Kombat! Liu <laughs> Kang wins. Next, a game that combined the thrills of space combat with talking cats. The rebels have taken the planet, my lord. At number 71, it's Wing Commander 2, Vengeance of the Kilrathi. I like to think the developers of this game used what I like to call boy math. You've got evil space cat empire plus spaceship with lots of weapons equals Every boy in the world wants to play this game because you're killing evil space cats with spaceships. I had a couple of cats growing up, but I, I looked at them a lot differently after playing that game. Released on PCs in 1991, Wing Commander 2 strapped players into the cockpit of their very own spaceship. Wing Commander 2 came out when I was 11 years old, and this game for me was amazing, and all I wanted to be was a starfighter, but you can't do that in real life because you, there aren't spaceships that fly around and fight aliens. But Wing Commander 2 was the first game that made me feel like it was real and you could do those things. Now we travel back a long time ago to a galaxy, well, not so far away. At number 70, the original arcade version of Star Wars. I think that first arcade version of Star Wars was like maybe the best Star Wars game ever made. The first Star Wars cabinets hit arcades in 1983, and fans of the franchise fell in love. They could sit in the cockpit of their own X-Wing and make a run at the Death Star just like in the movie. So what was cool about Star Wars for the arcade is you sat in this pod, so you actually felt like you were piloting the ship. And that was great, when the TIE Fighters shoot those big crunch berries at you, and you gotta shoot those. Then you get into the run on the Death Star, and then go into the Death Star and destroy the Death Star. That's That was just super fun. Luke, trust me. When you do blow up the Death Star, it flashes the brightest strobe light at you. Today would have 17 warnings on it. At that time, they're like, sure, go play that game. You gotta find out if you have epilepsy at some point. Star Wars vector graphics don't look like much compared to today's games, but in 1983, they blew people's minds. They had the smoothest moves, it looked really realistic compared to any of the other games. Whenever uh, things get really bad for me and I'm, things have just broken down, I can almost hear uh, Luke Skywalker say, I lost R2, because that's the way I feel when I'm, things have gone really bad, I feel like I've lost R2. LucasArts' 1983 arcade classic was the ultimate dream come true for millions of Star Wars fanatics. Use the boss, Luke. I don't think licensed games got really any better than that after Star Wars. And now for the classic beat-em-up that let you and a buddy join forces for a side-scrolling smackdown. At number 69, Double Dragon. Double dragon. Double dragon. Oh my god, that knee punch. Like when you grab a guy, you cry, and you just boom. Double dragon's an awesome game. Released to arcades in 1987, Double Dragon was as straightforward as games come. You're the Double Dragon dudes, and you have to go and fight the Black Warrior gang and like the side scrolling gang where you're beating them up so that you can save this chick, Marion. Double Dragon, it's like playing with two Patrick Swayze's for Roadhouse. It basically. That's the guy I want to be, like, take somebody down by the river and, like, break their neck and, like, 
you know. Double Dragon won over gamers with the then revolutionary opportunity for two person co op play. That was a great co op game. I love that. Me and my brother can both get down on the same time. If you both get to the end of the game together, you have to fight each other for Marion's love. And while Double Dragon strained the bonds of brotherly love, it also pushed the envelope of what games could achieve, inspiring generations of beat em up games to come. Double Dragon is fun. You just walk through. Punching and kicking, man. Punching and kicking, looking rad with a mullet. That's it. That's all you need in a game. Coming up next, parkour is king from the sands of Persia. I really like the Prince of Persia games. To the streets of Italy. It definitely made killing people look like good exercise. Plus, we go above the rim for a hardcore favorite. Boom shakalaka! But first, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time is the second highest grossing video game movie adaptation ever. What's first? Before the break, we asked, what is the only movie adaptation of a video game to gross more than Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time? The answer? Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, which made over $130 million. And now for a game that lets you defy the laws of physics as well as time and space. At number 68, it's Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie, I really like the Prince of Persia games. Released in 2003, Sands of Time was actually a reboot of the classic Prince of Persia series, created in the late 80s by gaming guru Jordan Mechner. I had the great good fortune to work with a fantastic team at Ubisoft Montreal uh, to bring back Prince of Persia, which, you know, in 2002, when we started making Sands of Time, was an old game. This game was all about sort of puzzle solving in 3D space, and you needed to climb up curtains and, and jump from ledge to ledge. Sands of Time updated Prince of Persia, adding 3D gameplay, sweet parkour moves, and of course, that handy dagger of time. If you make a mistake, you can actually rewind a little bit. Like if you fall, you don't make the jump, you can rewind a little bit. It's a great concept. You see that in a lot of games nowadays. That was the first one that I remember did that. It was a lot of fun. Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time turned back the clock on an aging franchise and was rewarded with several Game of the Year awards. Our next game made its way onto our countdown one brick at a time. At number 67, it's the groundbreaking and insanely addictive Minecraft. An amazing indie game that really put indie games on the map. An early version of Minecraft was released in 2009 and became a word of mouth sensation in the gaming community. Playing it, I remember, God, I remember this feeling. This feeling of discovering the gameplay, of realizing you can dig down, of realizing you can dig up, of realizing you can craft things. It's brilliant. Minecraft on the PC is the game that you fall in love with the first night you play it. This crazy, weird, you know, Lego block idea of a game got turned into a massive empire because the fans appreciated it so much. The gameplay is deceptively simple, but the possibilities are limitless. You explore a vast open world for resources that you then use to create buildings made of textured 3D cubes. And the thing that I actually like the most about Minecraft isn't even really playing Minecraft, but going online and seeing all the crazy that these kids built. I can I barely put a sword together and these kids have rebuilt the entire Game of Thrones set or the entire Final Fantasy world or like Star Wars and that to me is the best. Minecraft is a game like no other and one that is only limited by the scope of your imagination. Completely reimagined how I thought about a survival game, how I thought about a building game, how I thought about PC gaming in general. Now it's time to step into the Animus to take on the Templars. At number 66 is the highly acclaimed open world stealth action game, Assassin's Creed II. What I loved about it is the attention to detail, and I also thought the storyline was really engaging. Assassin, show yourself, or are you afraid? A 
Assassin's Creed 2, 100% sync, every single side mission, every single weapon. If I don't finish everything on the disc, I'm not, I'm not a whole person. Released to consoles in 2009, Assassin's Creed 2 sends Desmond Miles into the stealthy shoes of his badass ancestor Ezio and takes the fight for control of the modern world to 15th century Italy. This is one of, if not the most faithful recreation of any city in any video game ever. You play through this game and you feel like you've actually visited Italy. You would run across the rooftops and then run over and chat with Leonardo da Vinci. Sure. Now tell me, how may I be of service? Da Vinci was your guy who created all these crazy gadgets for you um, to help you complete your missions. Like he, he taught you how to fly. Shut the flying demon! The truth puzzles in the game, right? So incredibly hard. Anybody that tells you that they solved all of the truth puzzles, either A, look them up on the internet, which is probably what you guys did, or B, they're the smartest person in the world. But Assassin's Creed 2 isn't all puzzles and history lessons. The game is packed with sweet stealth moves and insanely killer action. They always had that same sick-ass weapon that would, like, a blade would pop up and just, like, stab some dude in the juggler. My favorite part of the game was going to all the vantage points and going way up to the top, and then you would flip down into those awesome barrels of hay. You'd be, like, jumping over rooftops and doing flips, and it was dope, dude. It definitely made killing people look like good exercise. Assassin's Creed 2 was met with heaps of critical praise and has sent almost 10 million gamers back to Renaissance Italy. I just want to stay in Renaissance Italy and be, you know, sword fighting and learning all those cool parkour moves, finding the pieces to put the picture together. Oh, that's, that's a great, great title. It's one of the most fast-paced, violent, and insanely fun video games ever made. At number 65, Unreal Tournament. Headshot. Unreal Tournament was a really fun game. I love the multiplayer aspect of that. Unreal Tournament was the first first-person shooter that Epic Games ever did, and it was an immediate success. It was frenetic, and it was a really good time. Unreal Tournament was released for the PC in 1999, and it was all about one thing, multiplayer carnage. You run around and kill people. <laughs> That's the storyline. <laughs> Unreal Tournament showed the world that, like, hey, you know, captivating, gripping single player story is great, but there's also this other thing that you can do. It was fast paced. Uh, you died a lot, but you also killed a lot. And it had a lot of fun, some futuristic weapons. One of the most, like, man moments of my life was playing Unreal Tournament while Oz was on on the other TV. So we're watching, like, prison and then playing Unreal Tournament at the same time. And it's like, it doesn't get any nerdier or more manly than that. Unreal Tournament was a trailblazing achievement in online warfare, featuring game modes that are now standard in most multiplayer shooters. The Call of Duties and the battlefields of the world, I don't think they'd be as successful as they are without the multiplayer component. And they owe all of that to what Unreal Tournament was doing back in the day. Coming up next, we set our sights on the original first-person shooter. Not only do you get to fight Hitler, it's a freaking robot Hitler. Before Kratos finally gets his revenge. God of War 3 is epic in the true sense of the epic. Plus, it's time for tip-off in the hottest basketball game ever. The game's on fire! If in a real game, if the ball was on fire, game over, let's reschedule this. But first, the announcer in NBA Jam is modeled after which famous sportscaster? The answer when the top 100 video games of all time returns. Before the break, we asked which famous sportscaster is the announcer from NBA Jam modeled after? The answer, Marv Albert who actually narrated the 1996 version of the game, NBA Jam Extreme. Next up, the game that set players on fire, one dunk at a time. 
you do flips, you do alley-oops, you do all of it. It's amazing. At number 64, NBA Jam. NBA Jam, dude. This is the best game ever. It was a basketball, but it was nothing but slam dunks and three-pointers. It was like if Red Bull invented basketball. It was awesome. I'm not a big sports guy. I've always been more into video games, but NBA Jam was one of those games that really kind of captured my heart and my imagination. Hitting arcades in 1993 and virtually every other gaming platform after that, NBA Jam became the most recognizable basketball game ever. And some, some of my friends would be like, man, NBA Jam is like not real basketball. But it's like, that's the whole point. It's like two on two and you just like super dunking on the perk. Uh, you know, NBA Jam was like one of my favorite games. Had all the best players, had Shaq when he was young, breaking backboards like this. <laughs> It wasn't even really about basketball. It was like this two-on-two -two kind of kung fu fest involving flaming basketballs. You could dunk from like half court, which um, I can never even dunk a basketball. So to see players actually dunk from half court who are actually on fire as well, I was a little concerned for their safety, but they were fine. <laughs> I can remember as a kid going out to the corner store and then playing against the older guys and uh, always just trying to catch fire. Woo, you get on fire, mm, the ball would be on fire. Like, woo, it's on, you're on fire! He's on fire! It will burn, it will burn the net. He's on fire! The ball is actually on fire, and that's supposed to be a good thing. If in a real game, if the ball was on fire, game over, let's reschedule this. But in this, well, that's a good thing. He's on fire! It was just something special about that game. Uh, the commentary. Boom shakalaka! Boom shakalaka! Boom shakalaka! From big head mode to boom shakalaka, NBA Jam gifted gamers with plenty of kick ass memories. I mean, for Six, you could play as a slam dunking cheerleader in that game. If that doesn't appeal to a huge demographic, I don't know what does. And now for the granddaddy of all first person shooters. At number 63, the seminal FPS Wolfenstein 3D. When Wolfenstein 3D was released in 1992, it featured revolutionary graphics and gameplay. It was the most nerve-wracking experience I'd had playing a video game in my life. Wolfenstein 3D, that was our first game that we actually had a gun, you know, in the middle of the screen. <laughs> Wolfenstein 3D was an epic leap forward for games, although its violent content gave some watchdogs pause. You're actually killing Nazis. Why is that bad, you know? All right, quick, pop quiz. Who is the best boss? ever to kill in the entire history of video games. Die, Allied Schweinhund. Mecha Hitler. Da. Eva, I'll be the same. Wolfenstein 3D blew away players and invented an entire genre of video games that are making more than a billion dollars a year. Hey! Up next, a game that lets you conquer the world. We are the most enlightened empire in the world. At number 62, Sid Meier's Civilization II. I spent a lot of time playing Sid Meier's Civilization. Civilization II is basically a, a big game of risk, only a lot more complicated with a lot more going on. And you are a civilization. You start out in the Stone Age and you have to create, you know, this society and it can collapse upon itself at any time. Your leadership is kind of what determines whether they're successful or unsuccessful, but you get to meet great historical figures. There's a lot of kind of fun stuff to do in a in a historical environment. This wasn't your typical button masher. Civilization 2 is for a, let's say, more bookish kind of gamer. Sid Meier Civilization 2 was too smart for me. I can't manage a civilization. It's just not within my power. Released for the PC in 1996, Civilization 2 expanded on the original by giving players new units, wonders, and technologies. Let us trade technologies now and destroy them later. It was cool building up your armies and, uh, and you know, civilizations. Oh, 
Up next, a game that managed to make Greek mythology fun. At number 61, it's God of War 3. That gotta be like one of the best video games like ever. God of War 3 was released exclusively to the PlayStation 3 in 2010 to great fanfare and high expectations from diehard fans of the series. It didn't disappoint. God of War 3 is, is epic in the true sense of the epic. When I first started the game, it was like you're climbing up this large, like, Mother Earth, and, like, Zeus is all the way at the top, and it's just, like, crazy. The God of War games are about this guy, Kratos, who was tricked into killing his family by Zeus, so now he has promised he's gonna go kill all of the gods. Kratos is an angry young man. Zeus! Your son has returned! He's got a lot of issues to work through. Kratos must be a real bummer at parties. Like, he's the douchebag in the corner doing Jaeger bombs, you know? God of War 3 pushed the PS3 to its limits with huge boss battles, swarms of enemies, and incredible graphics. The graphics was on point. I loved the, the fight and the combat in it. It's flingledy dingles. When I first started playing God of War, it was just like really one of those video games. Like, is this really happening during this game? Two thumbs up for God of War. Three thumbs up for God of War 3. Coming up on the top 100 video games of all time. I got it. I finished it. I'm addicted. We launch into the top 60 with some of the most infamous. I call it murder ride. Most difficult. This face melting. And most beloved games in history. People are so dedicated to that we get emails about the game still. Plus, Bo may know Tecmo. Tecmo is my favorite game. <laughs> but does he know the code? Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, B, A, select, start, two player. Find out when the top 100 video games of all time continues.